Good evening and welcome to Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm your host, Ian Satter. Tonight, we're going to travel across the state from the canyon lands of the Colorado River to the rolling hills of southeast Arizona and back to the open spaces that are around the Phoenix area. But first, let's take a trip through time at beautiful Lake Powell. Lake Powell sits like a shimmering turquoise jewel, magnificently framed by towering rock formations and soaring red cliffs, which surround the area for as far as the eye can see. There is truly nothing like it anywhere on the planet. I tell people, if you took me up in the woods at Flagstaff, where I couldn't see anything but trees. I could be in Maine or New Hampshire or Canada, but if you take me out here blindfolded and then whip the blindfold off, there's no place like this any place else in the world. You'd know exactly where you are right away. Outdoor writer and sportsman Bob Hirsch made his first trip to this area around 1969 and has been exploring it ever since. And one of his favorite places, as well as one of the main attractions of the lake, is Rainbow Bridge. And I never get tired of going back there. I told my wife Mary one day, I said, I'd like to go up to the bridge and just stay there until I'm tired of it. She said, don't do that. Your children will forget you. Because every day when you go there, your personality changes a little bit. How do you feel? Is the coffee cold this morning? Did you have a fight with your wife? The boat didn't start, whatever. And then hour by hour, it changes with the light. That's endlessly fascinating. Rainbow Bridge National Monument is taller than the nation's capital and nearly as long as a football field. It is the largest natural bridge in the world and before Lake Powell flooded Glen Canyon, it was one of the most inaccessible regions in the country. The Navajo culture considers it a sacred symbol of deities, responsible for creating clouds, rainbows, and rain, the essence of life in the desert. Today there is a courtesy dock, so visitors can access the bridge by boat, or for the more hardy, there is a 14-mile hiking trail that begins at the Navajo Mountain Trading Post. Lake Powell was formed when Glen Canyon Dam was built to hold back the mighty Colorado River. Construction began in 1956, and the dam was dedicated 10 years later. Once the giant floodgates were closed, it took another 17 years for the lake to completely fill. Now it's second only to Lake Mead as the largest man-made reservoir in North America. It's 186 miles long and has nearly 2,000 miles of shoreline, which is more than the entire west coast of the United States. Photographer Gary Ladd makes part of his living taking large format pictures of this lake and the canyon lands that surround it. Uh, this may sound a little bizarre, but I have to wonder about it because the lake level keeps changing and it exposes things uh, that I haven't seen before when it's down. And when it goes back up, it uh, totally rearranges things again. This is how the lake looked in the year 2000. And this is how it looked in 2006, after reaching its lowest level in decades. The fluctuating lake levels, plus the veering play of light on the red sandstone, means there is always something new for people like Gary Ladd to see and photograph. Well, it's looking pretty good this evening. It's um, clear to the west, so there aren't any clouds that will be in the way as sunset comes on, and yet there are clouds off to the east above Navajo Mountain, so I think this evening may be worthwhile for some good color. It's as if even the flooding of Glen Canyon won't stop her from showing off her treasures every now and then. Lake Powell has been in the midst of a drought for the last five years. In uh, this year, we're going to start coming up so Lake Powell is currently at a lake level of 3588 and it's going to come up to 3625 and the good thing about that is 
All the launch ramps will be wet, and the Castle Rock cut will be open, along with many other shortcuts on Lake Powell. So access and boating is going to be great. To really experience Lake Powell, you need to explore it by boat. The lake gives you access to a myriad of canyons painted with bands of vermilion, mauve, ivory, and chocolate rocks from the depth of time in living color. Big gorges branch into smaller gorges. They in turn divide into smaller canyons, each one exposing new and exciting things to see, like these fiery reflections dancing on the rocks. And everywhere, the cliffs of Glen Canyon tower overhead. It is worth repeating that there is no other place quite like it. One of the most popular ways to visit Lake Powell, especially for families, is by houseboat. The joy of houseboating is really you have all the amenities and luxuries of home in a, uh, what I would call, somewhat of a wilderness experience, but it's a great way to get away from everything, sit back, relax, enjoy beautiful Lake Powell. When you rent a houseboat, it is recommended that you also take a small powerboat along with you. Typically, you can find a quiet cove to park your home away from home, and then use the smaller boat to really explore the lake. And do some fishing, too. The drought has actually had a great silver lining for the fisheries at Lake Powell. As the lake went down, it exposed sediment that's been covered for 30, 35 years. As that sediment mixed with wind and wave action, it released the nutrients. Those nutrients were taken up by plants. That was eaten by plankton. Many plankton creates many shad, so the shad is our forage base, and once we had a tremendous number of shad out there, all the game fish got big, fat, and healthy. So the drought has been just a great thing for the, uh, the fish populations in Lake Powell. While fishing is very popular here, the greatest attraction is still the uniqueness of the area itself. Besides all the incredible beauty, there is plenty of history that still lines these shores. When Bob Hirsch was a younger man, he took us on a tour of the Miner's Stairs. Standing on some miner Stairs on the main channel of uh, Lake Powell, right across the uh, channel from Cathedral, and just a few miles from the entrance to uh, Rainbow Bridge Canyon. Back around the turn of the century, there was a minor gold rush. Now, there's no gold in sandstone, as far as we know so far, but there was some in the sand along the river that came down from, from Colorado and Wyoming in the spring floods. It was called flower gold, like cake flour. It was so fine. So the miners would load up their burrows. Now getting to the river was almost as much trouble as finding the gold. Imagine trying to find a way down to the river through these mazes of canyons. They'd get to a place like this where they had slick rock. The miner could sit down and slide down, but the burrow balked. He wouldn't come down. The answer was to stop for a, or a day or a week take out a, a chisel and a hammer and, and carve out a, a set of stairs for your burrow so he'd follow you down to the river. When the lake's at about 3680 elevation, you can step right out of your boat into these stairs and come up and uh, kind of take a, take a little walk in the past. Those steps continue on, all the way to the bottom of the lake where the Colorado River used to run free through Glen Canyon. Just as this boat causes ripples across the water, the construction of Glen Canyon Dam had the ripple effect of creating needed water storage and readily available electricity for our state. Unfortunately, the dam also had the effect of destroying most of Glen Canyon and impacting the ecosystems downstream into the Grand Canyon. In 1968, public opposition defeated proposals to build marble and bridge canyon dams which would have flooded much of Grand Canyon between Hoover and Glen Canyon dams. These areas are safer now because Glen Canyon was given up. Well, I suppose that uh, even though I didn't at first like the lake, it's because eventually, gradually, I realized that it's really an incredibly beautiful place. 
And even though I understand that uh, a tremendous amount was lost here, and in fact, some of it was right below at the mouth of Wawi Creek, it's really pretty amazing just the way it is. Even though the building of Glen Canyon Dam was steeped in controversy, the reality today is Lake Powell has become a popular destination in its own right, a fascinating place where you can still appreciate the beauty that was Glen Canyon and connect with the storied history of this rugged country. As we said, Lake Powell is a very unique place, just as the Mern's quail is a very unique bird. Let's head southeast and we'll introduce you to this clown-like looking creature. There are four species of quail native to Arizona. The gambles, the scaled, the masked bobwhite, and the Mern's quail. The Mern's quail are the largest of the group. Most of us are familiar with the Gamble's quail. Mern's quail have shorter tails and coupled with a tendency to sit low to the ground, it gives them a short, round appearance. The male Mern's quail have a striking, gaudy appearance. They have a black and white head with a mustache and sideburns pattern, earning them the nickname Harlequin quail. Their costume includes a spotted coat, a brown vest, black shorts, and topped off with a chestnut toupee. Both males and females have well camouflaged backs with modded brown, black, and tan streaks. When viewed from above, they are perfectly camouflaged among the autumn bunch grasses that make up their primary cover. In fact, these birds are so confident of their superb camouflage that they respond to danger by hunkering down and sitting tight, bursting into flight only at the last possible moment. This behavior is so ingrained that the response is the same even when there is no cover available. For this reason, when a bird is caught in open terrain without grass cover, it can be extremely easy prey for raptors and other predators. Mern's quail feed on insects, seeds from weeds and grasses, and green vegetation. A large part of their diet is made up of bulbs and tubers of a very few specific plants. Mern's quail have adapted large, powerful legs and feet equipped with long, curved claws to help them dig for these subterranean morsels. These divots in the dirt are evidence of Mern's quail searching for food. Their beaks are also much larger and stouter than any other quail species to allow them to handle these larger food items. Mern's quail are limited to a fairly restricted distribution in southeastern Arizona. Mostly associated with pine oak woodlands above 4,000 foot elevation, Mern's quail can also be found in mesquite grassland habitats and some coniferous forests often in hilly terrain dissected by numerous drainages. Mern's quail begin to form pairs in March and delay nesting until July, after the monsoon rains have begun. Because of their late breeding season, Mern's quail hunting season is delayed to allow young to mature. The seasons are closed in February to protect surviving adults and allow breeding pairs ample time to form. Hunting seasons are designed to protect developing young and breeding pairs while providing maximum hunting opportunity. Because of their unique habitats and behavior, Mern's quail can be very difficult to hunt. While they hold tight and are easily approached, this behavior protects them from detection. Hunters without the aid of dogs may walk past coveys all day long without knowing they are there. Hunting behind pointing dogs is widely accepted as the only way to hunt Mern's quail. Once the birds take wing, the hunter has but a split second to make the shot before the birds have disappeared around the trees or hillside so typical of their habitat. In addition to these factors, the very topography that they live in often turns a Mern's quail hunt from a gentlemanly pursuit to an athletic event. 
For the persistent hunter, though, a feast of Mern's quail under a cool winter sky is better than a dinner at a five-star restaurant. Like all creatures, the Mern's quail needs a suitable habitat to survive. The open spaces around the Phoenix area are home to many unique species of wildlife, and Arizona game and fish researchers are doing more to learn about who they are and how they live. After Arizona achieved statehood in 1912, it soon began to tout itself as the place of the five C's, copper, cattle, cotton, citrus, and climate. Health seekers from the rest of the nation discovered that the clear, clean, dry air of Arizona brought relief from various respiratory ailments, and the foundation was laid for the large number of immigrants and visitors that continue to infuse the state. Following World War II, a new wave of pioneers changed Phoenix into one of the fastest growing urban areas in the United States. A sea of desert grasslands was soon transformed into a sea of tile roofs. We live amid some of the most beautiful and biologically rich desert in the world, and this valuable resource is being threatened at an increasing rate. Arizona's population has doubled on average every 20 years since the census counted 204,000 residents shortly before statehood in 1912. During the next 30 years, Arizona will add another 8.5 million residents to the 6 million plus who already call this fragile place home. With sensitive planning and a commitment to maintaining our quality of life, we can accommodate growth and the preservation of the Sonoran Desert. While growth is inevitable, more and more people are demanding that our beautiful desert is maintained in their neighborhoods. As residents, we want to experience nature around us, no matter how brief the encounter may be. As developers rush to accommodate their wishes, the question is how much land should be set aside for these open areas and what should they look like? Arizona game and fish biologists have undertaken a study to investigate the biological needs of small mammals in urban areas. The purpose of this study was to look at the effects of urbanization on the species presence, abundance in some of these urban uh, desert remnant parks in the Phoenix area. It's important to understand what the small mammal populations are in these areas because the small mammals serve as a prey base for many other species including owls, coyotes, foxes and other larger mammals that are on these parks. The research plots were set in 10 parks in Phoenix. Um, the grids are composed of 30 traps uh, arrayed in uh, three lines at space interval of 10 meters apart. Traps are set out in the late afternoon and collected early the following morning. This assures that the animals aren't subjected to the heat of the day. This is called a Sherman live trap. It's a um, collapsible or foldable aluminum trap and it has a, a door on this end that is uh, caught down with a little uh, bracket. In the back there's a treadle so when the animal enters the trap and puts weight on that treadle it will um, snap the door closed. And generally we use a um, molasses cob which is just a rolled corn um, or oat mixture that you can buy in a, in a feed store and that, that attracts the uh, rodents into the trap. Collecting the traps is simply a matter of walking the trap line. If a trap is sprung, the trap is picked up for later processing. Little guy.
If the trap is empty, it is sprung so no animal can get caught in the heat of the day. Once all the traps have been gathered, the process begins. The first trick, getting the mouse out of the trap. We simply put a large Ziploc bag over the end of the trap, open the trap door, and then with some force, shake over and out, and the rodent goes into the bag, and then we can close the bag and remove the rodent from the bag in order to process it. And then we process these animals by collecting measurement data, weight, uh, length ear. of tail, length of the ear, et cetera, to identify them to species. We mark these animals with some indelible ink uh, and clip their hair and um, sex them. Notice the mask and gloves? Hantavirus is a huge concern when handling any rodent. One of the concerns during this project is making sure that we practice uh, good safety precautions for both the rodents and for the handlers. And as part of that, we wear latex gloves at all times when we're handling these rodents. And we also utilize these masks, which are called N95 particulate respirators. The reason that we use these masks is that rodents can carry diseases such as hantavirus, which can cause very severe respiratory syndromes in humans. We have been catching three main species in these parks. Uh, one of the more common ones is called Neotoma albigula, which is the white-throated wood rat. And this wood rat has been uh, fairly abundant in these parks. Uh, this wood rat is a little bit more difficult to handle than some of the other species because of its larger size and they tend to bite more frequently. Uh, my favorite one to handle is the smallest species that we catch which is the rock pocket mouse and this one is extremely uh, passive to handle and we never have any bites from this rodent. It'll make them easy to recognize. Once the animals have been processed, they are taken to their capture site sure. and released. Once we have finished processing the animal, we put it back in its trap and then the traps are individually numbered so we can take that animal back to the exact site where it was captured from and release it. The animal is generally not harmed in any way and then on the following captures we can look for the pen marks and see if this is an animal that we have captured previously or if it is a new capture. The information collected from this session, combined with data from other parts of the study, will allow the department to make intelligent recommendations to land use managers and property owners as to how to best design for open spaces to ensure wildlife population diversity. As we explained, smaller creatures are a food source for larger ones, and one of those animals you might find near an urban area is the bobcat. The bobcat is found throughout the American Southwest in almost all habitat types, especially in mountains and desert areas where water is available. Bobcats favor rocky, brushy hillsides on which to live and to hunt. The name bobcat may have originated from its short tail, which is only six or seven inches long and is always black tipped with white. The bobcat has long legs and very large paws. Large specimens can weigh up to 30 pounds, but the average is only 15 to 20 pounds. Geographic variations have some effect on coloration. Those found in timber and heavy brush fields are darker with rust-colored tones, while those found in desert areas are generally a paler, tawny gray. Despite its pussycat appearance when seen in repose, the bobcat is quite fierce and is equipped to kill animals as large as a deer. Bobcats get by on a diet of rabbits, ground squirrels, mice, pocket gophers, and wood rats. Its mating behavior is similar to a house cat's. Young are usually born in April and May, although litters may be born during almost any month except December and January. It does not dig its own den. If a crevice or a cave is not available, it will den in a dense thicket of brush or sometimes choose a hollow in a log or a tree. The normal bobcat litter consists of two to three kittens. 
born blind and weighing four to eight ounces. Birth occurs after a 60-day gestation period. Kittens are taught hunting skills by their mother until they leave her nine or ten months later. Young bobcats appear as lovable and harmless as domestic kittens, but they are wild animals with the ability to inflict severe injury to humans. That's our show for tonight. If you'd like any information on anything you've seen, visit our website at azgfd.gov. For producers Gary Schaefer and Carol Lind, I'm your host Ian Satter. We'll see you next week.